Let's talk about the Iditarod Trail Dog Sled Race. For those unfamiliar, it's a 1100 mile race that takes place once a year from Anchorage to Nome, Alaska. Now, I acknowledge that people's opinion can be rather polarized about this race. Some think it's great, and others think it's inhumane. Whatever your opinion may be, I encourage you to keep watching this with an open mind. My goal is not to completely condemn or praise one side, rather, I'm hoping to ask some questions and make some observations that will help open a dialogue between the two to help create a race both sides can be happier with. With that said, I'm going to be addressing three things. The laws surrounding animal cruelty in Alaska, the race itself, and the kennels where dogs are raised. First up, the laws. While I was doing research for this, I was saddened to hear that some maniac on a snowmobile terrorized two sled teams, killing one dog and injuring several others. For those who know me, they know that huskies are about my favorite animal on the planet, and to hear that one was killed so horrifically really makes me sick to my stomach. Thankfully, they've apprehended the man responsible, and he's being charged with quite a colorful list of things. Two counts felony third degree assault, three counts reckless driving, one count reckless endangerment, and six counts fifth degree criminal mischief. But if I translate those charges into English, you may see something eerily missing. Two counts making the mushers fear for their lives with his snowmobile, three counts of driving like an idiot, one count of dangerously driving like an idiot, and six counts of damage to property. See anything missing from the list? No charges of animal cruelty. But how can that be possible? Well, to clarify, there is one charge on the list for the animals, the last one, damage to property. Yes, by Alaskan law, the dog killed, Nash, is considered only as property. That's not because Alaska doesn't have animal cruelty laws, but because an interesting line in those laws specifically exempts sled dogs from them. This section does not apply to generally accepted dog mushing or pulling contests or practices or rodeos or stock contests. In other words, animal cruelty laws only apply to pets, and dogs used in competitions, legally speaking, are not pets. This bars anyone from being charged with animal cruelty for deaths and injuries that occur during the race. This affects people on both sides, as mushers can get little legal solace for those who kill their dogs, but it also protects mushers from being found at criminal fault if their dogs die on the trail. The latter of those two reasons upsets most opponents of the race, as well as Alaska's lack of an overdriving clause in its cruelty laws. In other words, you can't be charged with animal cruelty if you work an animal to death. To be fair, the Iditarod Trail Committee has the right to ban anyone from the race for life who they see as an animal abuser. Thankfully, this goes beyond the legal definition, and they've enacted this privilege several times in the past. Personally, I'd like to see the little loophole taken out. It would prevent the ask no questions manner of dog deaths on the trail now, and it would help clear up the Iditarod's name a little by assuring its sponsors that mushers can't push their animals to the breaking point. This would also make way for independent state-run investigations of dogs that do die on the trail, like Stiffy and Wyatt from last year's race. Now let's talk about the race itself. The first issue is the length. While researching this, I quickly found that debating it turns out to be rather contentious. So rather than telling you what I think in the matter, I'll just ask you. Do you think it is asking too much of dogs to pull a sled for 1100 miles? Before you answer, I find it important to point out that many dogs that run the Iditarod Trail Race also run the Yukon Quest Race, which is 1000 miles long and ends about 10 days before the Iditarod Trail Race begins. Both of these races are more than double the length of the lengthy race that was run in the heyday of dog sledding called the All Alaska Sweepstakes. To put this in perspective, running both races is about the equivalent of running from Los Angeles to Chicago in under a month with a 10 day break in Denver. Again, do you think that's too much to ask a team of sled dogs, or do you think it's perfectly reasonable? Now, avid proponents of the race state that these are very athletic animals and they would not run the race if they didn't want to. I have to agree with the first part. Huskies are incredibly athletic. Some owners have described them as constantly bursting with energy, and running is one of their favorite ways to expend this energy. That being said, I do find the second part of the statement debatable. A cheap shot but valid counterpoint is that mushers are allowed to carry whips. Do I think they all do? Of course not. Do I think some do? I wouldn't doubt it in the slightest. To that, I'll ask a question for you to decide for yourselves. Is an animal doing something he wants to if he has to be whipped in order to continue? 
A better point though has to do with the nature of training animals like this. If you own one or more dogs and engage in training them, you have to establish yourself as a pack leader. Even though they are domesticated, dogs still have a pack mentality and successful trainers establish themselves as the leader of the dog pack, even for just a one dog situation. As such, those who assume that role have the ability to keep dogs very obedient. In other words, they do what they're told. I also think it's reasonable to assume that dogs who make the cut to be on a sled team are those who are most fiercely loyal to the musher in a submissive way. Now I'm not claiming that that's a bad thing on the surface. It's good to maintain control of your animals, but it also comes with a heavy responsibility as some animals will literally follow their leader to their deaths. Like before, I'm not convinced that all mushers do this. I'm well aware of many mushers that know and respect their animal's limits and don't take too much privilege with the pack leader role. However, the system as it stands now allows for no ramifications for those who do. This is particularly not hard to imagine in those with an overly prideful determination to win. I applaud the mushers who won't let the want of a trophy, or in this case a truck, let them push their animals too far. But I'm not convinced that everyone follows such a safe practice in pursuit of the title. This is especially true when you consider that mushers lease dogs for the Iditarod race. How can you know the limits of your animals if they're not the team you trained with? Another thing I've read a lot about in this regard is that injuries in any sport are unavoidable entirely, and this race is no different. Again, I partially agree. I do know that there is risk in everything in life, especially in sports, but unlike their human counterparts, the animals involved do not comprehend the extent of what's being asked of them. The mushers are also not the ones taking the brunt of the risks and dangers in the race. Granted, the race is treacherous all around and the sled drivers are not without risk, but certainly not on the level of what their animals face. Most of the risk comes from the condition of the trail, the condition of the weather, and the length of the trail. Obviously, race planners have no control over the weather, but they can control the path of the race. Several legs are considered especially hazardous. I won't name them all, but there's a stretch called Moose Alley where many deadly intercepts with moose have happened over the years. There's also a stretch over Farewell Burn, where a fire happened many years ago, leading to many injury-causing hazards resting just below the surface of the snow. My thought is, they've strayed from the historical Iditarod Trail many times for various logistical reasons, so why not stray again for the sake of safety? With all the Alaska Wild out there, there has to be a safer path. Another point of the race is to honor the Gnome Serum Run of 1925, which was a relay that brought anatoxin to the epidemic-stricken city. So why then is the race not a relay too? With all that being said, I do want to point out some of the things that the race committee has definitely done right for the sake of safety. First off, all the dogs that will be running in the race have to pass a thorough veterinary examination before they're allowed to run. There are also veterinarians at every checkpoint. However, checkups with them is entirely voluntary, so it's on the mushers to decide if they want to take the time to do periodic checkups on their team. For this reason, I can't help but wonder if a mandatory checkup might have saved the lives of Stiffy and Wyatt last year. Perhaps whatever condition they suffered from could have been caught at a checkpoint and they could have sat out the race before collapsing lifeless on the Alaska Trail. But it's impossible to know for sure. If nothing else, I'd at least like to see the musher put some kind of memorial for them on his site. But maybe that's just me being picky. Regardless, the mass involvement of veterinarians on the trail is wonderful and a great step in helping these animals stay safe. Another wonderful thing the committee has done is start an aerial supported drop service. What I mean by this is if a racer decides to drop out of the race, they and their dogs can be picked up by air and taken to any checkpoint they'd like. Most commonly they go to either the starting or finish line when this happens. I have nothing but applause and praise for this service. I hope they never limit or cancel this policy. Again though, it's up to the musher to request this, but I'm confident the most reasonable mushers know when to call it quits and when their team can take no more. Finally, there are mandatory resting periods. I'm glad to see these, as it prevents overly zealous mushers from running their dogs non-stop for the whole race. Each team is required to take two 8-hour and one 24-hour rest during the race. The teams are welcome to take as many as they need beyond that, of course, but this is the minimum. I'm not sure if that is enough, considering that the race lasts from 8 to 14 days most of the time, but at least it's something. 
Safety on the trail, like any other sporting venue, is an ever-evolving ideal. It's important for us to always pay close attention to these things so we can see areas that can make the race a better place for the dogs and mushers alike in the future. There's also a responsibility on the race administrators to be transparent about incidents. If they don't openly report them, how will we ever know how to improve the race to prevent them from happening again? Last but not least, let's take a look at the kennels sled dogs are raised in. Before I begin, I find it necessary to again point out that I'm aware that there are reputable breeders that treat their animals very well. However, you can't deny some well-documented atrocities that have happened for the sake of the Iditarod and dog sledding in general. Whether these are isolated incidents giving a good industry a bad name, or a sign of more systematic problems, I'll leave up to you. I will warn you that some images in this section may be disturbing to some. The first potential kennel issue is what's commonly called tethering. That is, attaching an animal to a stake or pole to contain them in a small area. Proponents of this practice claim that it prevents unwanted breeding and fighting, prevents mass escape in the event of a compromised fence, and allows for better diet control as you can ensure how much food each animal gets. On the flip side, opponents say that there are very few circumstances where tethering an animal is a good solution and, even at that, should only be done temporarily. Spaying and neutering animals not needed for breeding can easily control populations effectively. Huskies are social animals and limiting their ability to socialize with one another may actually make them more aggressive and prone to fight. Huskies are also very active animals that like to pull things, and long-term tethering can lead them to take drastic measures to try to expend their energy, which has led to many injuries and deaths when they get tangled in the chains. In the most extreme cases, dogs have practically lived out their entire lives never leaving these restraints. In any case, tethered or untethered, leaving dogs unsupervised for long periods of time is never a good idea. Again, I'll leave it up to you if you think tethering is ethical or if the enclosures they live in are adequate. I'll leave you with this question though. If you're a dog owner, would you feel comfortable leaving your dog at such a place over the weekend? The last issue I want to discuss is culling, or mass euthanasia. The question to ask yourself is, when commercially breeding animals, is it inevitable? I'll take a stab at this one. I think that with responsible selective breeding, it doesn't have to be. There are, of course, some circumstances where it's unavoidable. The Humane Society has to euthanize thousands of animals due to shelter overcrowding, and sick animals deserve to be put down with dignity if they can't be saved. The problem comes from massive overbreeders seen commonly in puppy mills. In the sled dog world, though, they're not raising mass quantities to try to sell them off as a popular breed. They're breeding mass quantities in hopes of getting a few that will be good racers. The surplus animals have suffered a variety of fates ranging from being set loose in the wild to mass slaughter. In Whistler, British Columbia, there was a massive slaughter at a sled dog tourism company following a severe drop in business. Dozens of dogs were either killed by gun or knife over a period of three days. Thankfully, laws have since been passed to try to prevent such things from happening again. In the kennels of Frank Rich, sled dogs being bred and raised for the Iditarod were kept in deplorable conditions that led to many deaths. The bodies were literally thrown in a heap in the back of a truck. Many times, breeders see veterinarians as too expensive or too far away, and they opt to euthanize by bullet, as it's cheaper and faster. For those that have seen my review of Balto, it's important to note that in the most extreme of puppy mill scenarios, both Balto and Togo would have been killed for not being top sled dog material, though their actions later in life certainly proved otherwise. I bring these things up not to anger you, scare you, or disgust you, but to acknowledge that despite our best intentions and high views of the event, we can't turn a blind eye to these tragedies. The more people are aware that things like this can happen, the less people will be able to get away with it. So where does this all leave us? Well, the Iditarod Sled Dog Race is a large and complicated event. It takes massive amounts of people and canines in and around the race to pull it off. Therein, there are many great, loving, and dedicated owners, breeders, mushers, and organizers. But there are also those who treat the animals horribly with little remorse. Where the balance exactly lies between the two is impossible to determine. It's also important to note that no law or rule can be written that can force someone to care about the life and well-being of a dog if they hold no value for those animals in their hearts. However, through honest conversations on both sides, we can come up with standards that they would have to adhere to if they wanted to be part of the event in the first place. 
Such changes should not punish those who truly care for their animals and treat them well. This may also increase sponsors' confidence in the event if they know it's being held to high standards, both in the event and the industries that support it. So what will these changes look like? I don't know. Perhaps we should change the cruelty laws. Maybe the race will turn into a relay. Or it could be rerouted. Maybe the race could have multiple events, like the Olympics, to award for a variety of physical aptitudes, not just a long-distance race. Perhaps they could increase the time between the Iditarod and the Yukon Quest to ensure that dogs have ample time to rest. Maybe kennels could be more heavily regulated to punish those who practice unethically. Whatever these changes may be, they will never happen if we don't start talking about it. So whatever your stance in regards to the Iditarod, I encourage you to join the conversation. Just remember that this is not a black and white issue, so be respectful of others' opinions, even if they're opposite of yours. Hopefully we can find some common ground in all this and work towards solutions that everyone can live with, especially our furry four-legged friends. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Feel free to check out some of the source links in the description for more information and further reading.